Today, I'm going to show you what I do when I'm building a rain garden. It's just 10 easy steps. Um, and there are some technical areas, but I just need, I just want you to remember that a rain garden is nothing more than a hole in the ground that allows water to be absorbed by the plants in the soil. That's it, a hole in the ground that can absorb the water. It works on gravity. So if you can get water into the hole, your rain garden will work. Build it with friends. It's faster, it's easier, and it's a lot more fun. Finally, turn off your sprinklers and get the free water from Mother Nature. My first step is to walk the property. I want to know the flow of that property. When it rains, where does water flow off the roof? Where does it flow off the patio? Where does it flow off any of the surfaces on the house that aren't absorbing water? So here's that specific house that I talked about. We're going to look at the front yard first. So on the left side, you can see there's a downspout and a rain barrel. And on the garage, there are two downspouts that you can't see because they're inside the garage and you have a pitched roof that leads to a flat roof on top of the garage. And here's those two outlets. And then you have the water that hits the patio, right? So you have the patio water that flows to the lawn. And don't forget your lawn, um, while it'll absorb some rainwater, still still flows off the property. You also have this, <clears throat> these steps, water flowing off the property there. The driveway runs downhill, water flows off the property into the street. And then finally, this little sidewalk entrance on the side where water flows off the property. Okay, let's look at the backyard. We have two drains from the roof in the backyard. The one on the left drains into a rain barrel, and when that overflows, it drains onto the concrete towards the lawn, and then ultimately out to the street. The one on the right also drains to a rain barrel, but it drains into that side yard, which ultimately hits the street as well. Then the concrete, or the patio, it drains downhill straight to the lawn area and ultimately to the street, as does the walkway on the left-hand side. So now we're going to determine the runoff volume from the roof area. Here's where our five drains are again, our five downspouts from the roof. Our first area that we're going to look at is in the front yard that drains to the left drain. We'll call that drain one. And when I measure it with a tape measure, and I can just do this on the ground, you don't have to get up on the roof. I'm measuring the length of the rain gutter to that corner and then the width from the peak of the roof down to the front. So I've got a width and a length of, I've got a width of 20 feet and a length of 33 feet. When I use my area formula, that gives me 660 square foot. But today we have Google Earth Pro. And with Google Earth Pro, I can simply trace the area on top of my roof. I just put in the address of the property. I drain the area or I measure the area on top of the roof. I make sure I'm in square foot and I get the same result, 660 square feet. So roof drain one, 660 square feet. Roof drain two, it drains this peak part and the flat part of the garage. Roof drain two using Google Earth. Actually, it's roof drains two and three, gives us 875 square foot. Roof drain four, it drains to the right-hand side of the backyard. It's 700 square foot in total. And roof drain five is a small section here, and it drains approximately 350 square foot. So here we're gonna to try to determine runoff volumes from the patios and drainage areas of the patios. There's where our five roof drains are. 
Here's the areas from the roof that were that we've already calculated. And then that's the the way water flows off the patio, goes downhill to the grass and then out to the street. And that patio area in the backyard is 900 square foot. In the front yard, you can see we've already changed the patio and made it so that it drains into where we're going to put where we're going to build our rain garden. That area is also 900 square feet. Okay, here's the math portion <laughs> of the talk. Uh, but don't worry, I've created these spreadsheets and we have a calculator that you can use for free on the ecomalibu.org website. That's ecomalibu.org. So all the calculators you see in this presentation are on the website and they're free to use and it'll make your life a little bit easier. So here we're gonna determine our runoff volume in gallons from the drainage areas that we just calculated. I'm using a one and a quarter inch storm and I'm gonna convert that one and a quarter inches to rainfall feet by dividing it by 12. And then I simply multiply the rainfall feet. These are automatically filled in, the rainfall foot column. To, to get cubic feet. And then from cubic feet, I multiply it by 7.48 to get gallons. So if I catch a one and a quarter inch storm and put it into the rain garden, I would generate almost 3000 gallons of rain in a single one and a quarter inch storm. I like this formula because it also gives you cubic feet. So if I use a 12 inch rain garden, and dig it 12 inches deep, I need 381 cubic feet of area to capture this amount of water. So if I can get a 381 foot or bigger garden, um, I, can, I can capture all of the 2,852 gallons of rain generated by an inch and a quarter storm. I can also use this calculator to see how much rainfall will be generated in an entire year. So the average rainfall where this house is located is 19 inches in an, in an average year. That, that becomes 1.58 feet of rainfall. And when you add it all up, you get 43,347 gallons of runoff that will be captured in the rain garden during entire year. Now that we know the size in cubic feet and the volume in gallons, we can create a rain garden shape and size. First, we wanna know how big a rainstorm do we wanna capture and treat. In LA County, the guidelines for new development is an 85 percentile storm event which is the equivalent of three quarter inches of, of rainfall in a 24 hour period. And if your garden's big enough to capture a three quarter inch storm in a 24 hour period, 85% of all storms will be captured and treated by your rain garden and, and held on site. We like to catch the first flush and the first flush is is the amount of rainfall it takes to really wash all the dirt, pollutants, oils, grease, pesticides, herbicides, litter, dog poo from the roadways and the rooftops before that water becomes clean again. And generally after about an inch and a quarter to an inch and a half rainstorm, the runoff becomes much, much cleaner. So we try to go for at least an inch and a half storm so we capture and treat the first flush now that we've calculated the volume of, of runoff that we're going to capture and put into the rain garden we can create the shape and size in this case i've i've drawn kind of the shape that i want to put in there and the width and length of it and it totals about 320 square foot of surface area One thing you want to make sure is that we're not allowing water to absorb into the ground within 10 foot of the house foundation. 
This is about 10 foot of the house foundation. So in this area, we can put water in, but we want it to travel through. We don't want it to, to, to absorb into the ground there. So we're not creating any holes there. We're just creating a swale that, that pushes it to the outside of that 10 foot area before we start to sink it in the ground. The average width is of this shape is eight foot. The average length is 40 foot and our average depth is about 16 inches or 1.33 feet. That gives us 433 cubic feet of rain garden in this shape if it's 16 inches deep. That's more than enough to capture our 381 cubic feet of water that will be generated by an inch and a quarter storm. If we make it deeper, we can capture more. We can also play with the shapes of our rain garden here. So for example, if I change the width from eight foot to 12 foot, I can shorten my length to 27 feet. If I change my average width to 10 foot, I can shorten my length to 32 feet. So you, you can play with the shape and size based on how much water you're trying to capture. The next step, remove the grass. Before you dig, we call dig alert which is 811. They also have a website, which is call811.com. You call them 72 hours before you're gonna dig, they will come out and mark all the utilities on your property. That way when you dig, particularly if you're gonna be using equipment, you don't hit any utility lines, gas, water, sewer, etc. Very important. So again, remove the grass. You wanna know exactly where your water lines are and exactly where your gas lines are. I can't tell you how many houses, particularly older houses that I've gone to where either the water, the gas, or both squiggle all through the lawn. There's supposed to be a certain depth, 18 inch for a water line, 36 inch for a gas line. Um, and I've had them be as shallow as two inches. So I always, particularly if I'm gonna use heavy equipment, is I will dig and find both my water line and my gas line so I know exactly where they are and I make sure I'm not gonna hit them or damage them. So you can, you can remove the grass a number of ways, the hard way, is simply digging it up, shovels, pickaxes, hoes. You can remove the grass and plants if you have a month ahead of time or you have a month of, of notice. You can use a, a technique we call sheet mulching. And here they're using cardboard. Um, you can also use thick biodegradable paper and then you're gonna put six inches of mulch on top of it and just let it sit there for a month and kill your lawn without having them remove it. It'll just, it'll kill the lawn and it'll actually bring some nutrients into your soil because the, the compost or the mulch will start to break down and provide nutrients and feed the beneficial insects in your soil. You can remove grass and plants as long as you have a month ahead of time using a solarization process. And that's simply putting black plastic, usually a six mil black plastic over the top of the lawn and frying it, letting the sun cook it, letting no light get into it, and again, killing the lawn. But you still need a month ahead of time. You can also bring in heavy equipment, bring in the big guns to remove your grass and plants. This is a compact excavator. This is a skid steer. Anyone can rent them at a, at a good rental yard and they cost between 150 and 200 bucks a day and you can use heavy equipment to help you get the job done faster and easier. You can also use a sod cutter. This is what we use most frequently. It's a walk behind kind of thing, machine, and um, it's easy to use. Costs about 100 bucks a day to rent. And here you can see it in action. 
You just push it along and it cuts the sod from the bottom or the grass from the bottom. And then you roll it up and put it in your dumpster or compost it. Step five, now that we remove the grass and the plants, we're gonna bring the water in. We're gonna plumb the rain garden. There's our five roof drains again. So you can see these arrows show, if you did nothing else, you can bring in the patio, the steps leading up to the house and the roof drain on the left, they're already going right into the rain garden. So if you just capture those, using a swale right a swale is just a little ditch we use rock to line it so that it doesn't erode the bottom of the soil and you just plumb that directly into the rain garden where you want to where you want the water to hit and we use swales as much as possible to bring the water into the garden because they're less expensive and they're easy we use them to connect the existing downspout and patio on the front yard to the rain garden we also can use them to, to direct pipes to where we want those, where we want the water to hit in the rain garden. So swales are your friend. In this case, there's our five drains again. They want to capture the runoff from the garage and from this area of the roof and they wanna make sure that gets into the rain garden. So they're gonna use what we call a trench drain or a channel drain. They're not hard to put in. They take a little bit more work, but they're, they're fairly easy. Remember, that's the runoff from in front of the garage area. There's one on both sides. And again, the downspout's inside the garage. Here you can see where they cut it with a saw, right? You can use a skill saw or you can rent what we call a rip saw or a cutoff saw from the from the uh, rental yard. There's a close up of the trench drain cut. There's a cutoff saw, and they rent for probably fifty dollars a day. But we I use a skill saw most of the time with a masonry blade. And then there's the drain itself. You can get this at any good irrigation store. It's a four irrigation store. It's a four inch wide drain. It flows directly on a slight angle to where we want it, want it to go. And you've seen these drains in millions of places around town, right? You can see the grates. They're easy to put in. They just snap together. He's using a level to make sure it's level when he's setting it. And it's, 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 a, it's an easy process. Here we're gonna bring the water in from the backyard drains. There's our two backyard drains. And what we're going to do is we're going to connect pipe and drains to capture the water coming off the patio, coming off both roof drains, and bringing it around to the front of the rain garden. So here's, here is the backyard drain on the left-hand side. We cut a trench. We ran it. straight to the backyard to the grass so that drain not only captures the runoff from that downspout it captures any runoff from the patio that will flow to this drain and then you can see i'm looking down the backyard there's two more drains again capturing runoff from the patio here's my fourth drain and this is the overflow of the rain barrel on the right hand side and you can see it's capturing it into a drain. And then here's our trench. You can see we got a masonry wall. So I couldn't run a trench there. I couldn't run a swale there. I have to go under that wall. So it requires a pipe. And there's the pipe as it goes underneath the masonry wall and comes out to the front yard. And here I've already tested it to make sure the water's flowing downhill and out of the, out of the pipe. Step six, amend the soil. You want to make your soil spongy, healthy, nutrient rich. Think of a forest floor, right? So we always add six to eight inches of organic matter. We use compost made from vegetation or kitchen waste. We try to avoid 
manure compost because they're high in metals. We have a formula and the calculator is again at ecomalibu.org for figuring out how much compost we need. So the formula is simple. Calculate the yard area by the feet of compost, divide it by 27 to get yards of compost. They sell compost in yards at most places. So here's our house again. This is our area, our rain garden area. Using our friend at Google, we get 845 square foot of surface area that we want to amend the soils. There's our formula again. If I multiply 845 square foot by six inches or half a foot divided by 27, it's about 15.6 yards, call it 16 yards of compost. By making the soil spongy, you're feeding the beneficial insects and the beneficial organisms that live in the soil. Here's a beautiful scoop of compost and you want to mix that thoroughly, mix that into your soils, right? I like to go at least 14 to 16 inches deep. There's a few ways you can do it, but we use mostly these things, digging forks, and we'll just add the compost to the soil, the bottom of the depression, after it's dug for better drainage. If your soil becomes compacted, you can simply use a garden fork to loosen it. Just get it in there, in the ground, rock it back and forth, and that will loosen it right up. Now we have nice, loamy, or loose soil. Now we're going to go ahead and add some compost. You can see how fluffy that makes the soil. And I prefer to use a garden fork, but you can also use a rototiller. Again, you can rent this from any rental yard. Um, depending on your soil, these can be hard to operate on super hard soils. But um, if your soils are very bad, you might want to consider using a rototiller to compost or to mix your compost into the soils. Again, Spongier lets it absorb more, compost creates more nutrients, makes the plants grow better. It also stores water. It's, it's ideal for a rain garden. And here again, rototillers can damage beneficial soil organisms and should be used only when soils are exceedingly bad. Step seven, can you dig it? So basically this is a, a cross section of what your rain garden is going to look like. You can see it's got the rain garden soil mix at the bottom. The key here is where it says three to one or less, right? Three to one or less, you want to make sure that your side slopes are three foot long for every foot in depth so that they're shallow sloped and not steeply sloped. Shallow slopes are much better for, for water, much more resistant to erosion, and also easier to grow plants on. The other thing that you have to be remembering, or you have to remember, is your overflow. Your overflow has to be lower than your inflow, right? This is your safety mechanism. You're gonna be storing water on site. You're gonna be basically flooding your site and you have to have an outlet for that water so that it doesn't flood important areas like your house, your steps, the patio. So we wanna make sure that we put our outlet four to six inches, and I say six inches, below the inlet where water's coming into the garden. Does that make sense? And here's our folks in the rain, which is a perfect time to uh, to make sure your rain garden's the right depth and it's flowing the right direction. Here we're using some of our bigger equipment that we got at the rental yard for 150 to 200 bucks a day. Again, bigger equipment. And don't forget the outlet, four to six inches lower than your inlet. Step eight, slow the flow, let the water sink in. 
So one of the things we do is we use check dams, right? Check dams are basically these, these boulder formations, right? And you can see we've, we've got these boulder formations. So as water comes down the hill, it hits those boulders, it slows down, and it allows the area behind those boulders to fill up. Once they get filled up enough, it will actually overflow the top of the boulders and go to the next area. So it's not just that we have a line of boulders to, to create kind of a dam effect, a check dam, we call it. We also have dug bowls into the landscape. So it's not just flat. We have areas that are deeper that can hold water and store water and allow that water to sink in. Again here, you can see the check dam. I've got, <clears throat> as water hits it, you've got these bold areas that are gonna store the water until it fills up and then overflows to the next pool area or check dam area downstream. Here's one where we've got a swale coming out of the pipe right here. So it's, con it's taking this water coming out of the pipe, bringing it into the rain garden. You've got this deeper area, pool area, that allows the water to, to build up. And here's our check dam, right? The check dam slows the water flow, allows it to build up and back up before it flows downstream to the next check, check dam area. And here's one that I, that, I, that I saw that's really cool. Super steep, upstream, water comes in, they've created this big pool area, and again, it slows down the flow. So it's coming really fast over the waterfall, but then it hits this pool area and is allowed to slowly fill up before it flows downstream to the next area. And here you can see an overhead shot of a garden I did. Again, you can see the boulders forming check dams and allowing the water to back up and sink in. Step nine, plant it. First question is how many plants? And this is a question I get a lot. My basic theory or the what, what I like to do is that I like to install at least one plant every two and a half feet. So if I take the surface area of our planting of where we want to plant and divide it by two and a half, a plant every two and a half foot, I get an approximate number of plants that I'm going to order. So in our case, we had 845 square foot. We divide it by two and a half feet for a plant every two and a half feet, and we get 342 plants approximately. Gives us a good starting point of what we're going to order from the nursery. Plant it. How do you choose plants? I look for plants that are tolerant of both occasional flooding as well as dry periods. I always use native plants and I always make sure they're adapted to the local environment. And meaning that they used to occur there or they occur there now and are perfectly adapted for the area that we're looking at. If we know they're, that they're from that area, that we know that they're not gonna need any supplemental water because they didn't have supplemental water before there were people. I always go to calflora.org, which is a website, and they have a mapping section that will show you if plants you're interested in used to occur on your site or by your site. Choose a mixture of species, at least 20. I choose more usually, and most of my plant lists are 30 plus, but if you have 20 or more species, it's gonna give your garden interest you're gonna have things that flower at different times of the year. You're gonna have more diversity that attract different types of bugs, different types of birds, different types of butterflies and provide different kinds of habitat. So diversity is key and will make your garden more interesting and more beautiful for longer periods throughout the year. Choose plants for vertical layering. So a mix of tall, medium and low growing species, right? Overstory is tall. Medium is kind of your shrub layer, and low growing is your ground cover layer. How to install your plants. In a rain garden, there's basically three types of moisture zones, and we'll talk about that in a minute. 
Plant your taller and larger plants in the center or at the back of the garden, depending on the views. Plant your shorter plants where they can be seen easily around the garden edges and plant them in front or next to or underneath taller plants, right? Think of this as a natural garden where you're going to have, again, taller overstory plants, shrubs, kind of mid-story plants, and ground cover, lower story plants. Space and plant trees and shrubs according to how big they're going to be when they're full grown, right? If you get plants in a one gallon container, your plants may be six inches wide now, a foot wide now. But for example, purple sage is going to be five foot wide when it's fully grown. If I want to plant three of them together, I want to make sure that they're at least spaced two and a half feet apart. So when they grow together and when they grow to be five foot, they're, there's they're not you know crowding each other out so remember how big your plants are going to be when they grow up so here's what we would said about their, our different moisture zones low the bottom of your rain garden place that's going to have water and where plants can be will be wet right for a period of time your middle section your plants can be wet for you know a couple days or so but not for a prolonged period of time. And then your upper section or your high section are gonna be plants that never wanna be wet, right? So submerge for several days in the wet zone, in the low zone, submerge for a day or so in the middle zone and never submerged in the high zone. What types of plants? So here's one of my plant lists and, and we can't go into every type of plant but if you go to ecomalibu.org, I've got several plant lists that I've assembled for many jobs that I've done. You can see I've put a middle, high, low, so you can see what zone they should go in. Um, this one has, I don't know, 30 or so different plants. Uh, and then in this case, they were. this was for that job. We ordered 375 plants. And my cost on them, which is a wholesale cost, was, you know, $1,100, almost $1,200. Uh, but depending on the plants you get and the size you get, that's going to vary. Depending on the nursery you use, prices are going to vary. But the key here is where it's going to be planted and the quantity of plants. Right? So here's a bunch of plants in one-gallon containers. Close up of those plants. Here's our friends. Again, invite your friends, make it a party, make it fun. You can plant a lot more plants with 80 of your friends than you can by yourself. And here's the cutest of our friends, my nephew, Eric. And he's a planting machine, I want you to know. And then again, here we're having a planting party, a bunch of one gallon plants, seven or so people throwing down plants, digging them into the ground, watering them with loving care so they'll get the garden started. Step 10, weed paper, river rock, and mulch. We use weed paper. In this case, it's, it's recycled craft paper. It's completely biodegradable. We can also use newspaper, right? If you can collect enough newspaper, just make sure you double it up so it's a decently thick layer. The craft paper is usually... Uh, a fairly thick product uh, and we use this to kind of keep out the initial weeds and give our new fresh plants a chance to grow without competition from weeds and this will work for I don't know the first six months to eight months before the the weed paper or newspaper biodegrades and it'll give our chance our plants a chance to establish and grow their roots before we start to get weeds in for competition right here's another picture of the weed paper getting put in and again we're having a planting party and they're cutting the weed paper around the plants uh making sure that they're they have plenty of room around the base of the plants and they're not straining them river rocks and mulch right so here's our boulders that we use for our check dams on the left and here's our river rock or our cobble, we call it. 
Um, river rocks are round. I always try to make sure I'm using a round river rock. I also like to find river rocks and, and boulders that match kind of the scenery of the area, right? So they look like they're from around from from around our area. We put so we want to put our river cobble, the smaller, smaller stones. Anywhere water is going to flow. This protects the soils against erosion where we're going to have flowing water. It also creates that dry stream bed look. And again, the boulders are used for our check dams. How much river cobble or, and mulch do I need? Again, calculators, ecomalibu.org. For cobble, it's usually about four inches thick. I got to convert it to feet from inches. And then I take my yard area and I subtract my rain garden area, which again was 325 square feet. The whole yard area was 845 square feet and gives me a mulch area of 520 square feet. If I figure out that I want to put in four inches of mulch, and we always put in four inches of mulch. Three inches is just not enough to keep the weeds out. We convert that into cubic feet, which equals 173, and we divide it by 27 to get cubic yards. So we're talking about six and a half yards of mulch. Then I like to reduce that number, or you should reduce that number. I use 30%. You could use a little bit more or a little bit less, depending on the density of your planting. And that gives us four and a half yards of mulch. Um, which takes into account the area that we're gonna take up with our plants. Mulch is critical. It not only keeps the plant roots cool, it lowers the evaporation of water that you're putting on it. So it means you're gonna need less water while you're getting your plants established. And it actually breaks down and provides nutrients uh, and food to the beneficial insects and to the soils themselves. To calculate river cobble, we already know that our garden is 320 square, 325 square feet. Our depth in cobble is about three inches, right? Or a quarter of a foot. Gives us our cubic foot of cobble, 81.3. We divide it again by 27 to get yards, because it's about three yards of cobble. I also subtract 30% from, <clears throat> From the cobble to account for the higher part of the walls or the higher part of the banks um, and then I have to convert that number so that gives us 2.1 yards and then you want to convert that to pounds because when you buy cobble you buy it or rocks you buy it by the pound so I multiply it by 2700 pounds which is about what a yard of, of three to six inch cobble weighs and it gives us 5,688 pounds of cobble or about three tons of cobble. Again, calculators are at ecomalibu.org. Finally, you're going to enjoy your rain garden. So here's a before and after and after. Here's another rain garden we did. This one, they actually used a drain so that it can go underneath the sidewalk. Rain garden maintenance. You're going to need to water your main, your rain garden while your, your plants become established, right? So after you first put in your plants, you're going to have to water them until they become established, a little more mature and can stand on their own. Always plant in the fall and winter. November or December is ideal. Our, my basic watering schedule is as follows. Week one, I water five days the first week. Week two, I, I take it down to four days. Week three to six, three days a week. Week seven to 12, two days per week. Weeks 13 through 49, one day per week. And then I don't water again until the following June. 
And when I water the garden, I water it twice a month from June through October. You don't need to rake or blow your leaves, your leaf litter. That's all free garden mulch. It's going to help keep your weeds down. It's going to help nutrient, provide more nutrients to your soil. And it was one of the beautiful things about rain gardens. They don't need constant raking or blowing. Trim plants as you deem necessary. Refresh the mulch or add new mulch at least every two years, right? So depending on the kind of mulch and how fast it's breaking down, you can just add a little bit to it and fluff it up, or you can refresh the whole place every couple of years. And it's going to become less and less as your plants grow in. Watch during rainstorms to make sure the garden is operating as designed. Make sure the overflow is working. If it gets to a certain stage and it's starting to flood your patio, you need to lower your overflow. Soak in the free rain and watch your garden flourish. It's easy. Build it. Bring your friends and enjoy your rain garden. Thank you.